Hi everyone! I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy um, and I hope you were able to access the videos that I put on YouTube. Sounds like this will be a much better alternative um, as to uploading it to Blackboard because apparently although Blackboard has the option to upload videos, it's not recommended. So from now on we're going to stick to this and um, just a reminder that you will have your chapter one and chapter two quizzes that expire on the 29th and each chapter is separate um, and we'll each have 20 questions. So today I will be going over the lecture slides for chapter two um, and just a reminder that if you are having trouble viewing this video or anything at any point, the notes that I use, um, that like if you see me looking off the screen, it's because I have the slides open myself, and the notes that I read are in the slides as well. So I mean, if all else fails. Um, and for those of you, hopefully, that liked the cameo of my puppy, I have returned to my hometown and I'm staying with a family member and I'm now surrounded by numerous dogs. So hopefully they don't photobomb too much, but I've already got one over here. So if any pop in and out, I'm sorry, but all right, let's get going. So um, this is a pretty heavy chapter, pretty full, covering all the major bodily systems, not in too, too much detail because um, this isn't a nursing course or a biology course, but because health psychology is concerned with the impacts of health and wellness, we need to have an understanding of the bodily systems that can be impacted. So as you can see from the chapter outline, we're going over several different systems of the body and then ending with a discussion on genetics and their impact on health and then the immune system. So to start, um, I will say on some of the slides, you'll see a YouTube link. Um, so for the nervous system, the um, endocrine system, and the, the heart, um, and the respiratory system. So these aren't mandatory. Like I said, the quizzes and the exams will include items about information from the text. So obviously if it's not in the text, then um, it won't be on your quizzes. That said, um, these are, f some of them are a little long um, and go into much more detail than you need. So for example, the nervous system, um, the first three to five minutes gives a good overview of the nervous system, but it's about an 11 or 12 minute video. Um, so I've included these for the major complex, more complex ones, um, but it's just from a guy whose video style I really like. He does crash course videos. So if it's something you're interested in or you just wanna see it said from a different perspective, feel free to give those a look just to give you guys a bit more variety for learning. Um, I really like him. He speaks really, really fast. Um, but he's very engaging, so check it out if you like. Um, okay, so with that, we'll start with the nervous system. So this is comprised of, as you can see in the chart, it breaks it down into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. It's the first division. So the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. So central meaning like really the hub, right, the center of all the nerves, which kind of makes sense with the brain and the spinal cord and everything kind of flows from there. So it's responsible for carrying voluntary nerve impulses to skeletal muscles and to the skin and involuntary impulses to muscles and glands. So by voluntary, we mean things that we can control consciously, like the movement of the muscles and the parts of their body. Um, and in comparison, involuntary impulses would be things that we don't have any influence on, like digestion or our heartbeat. Now, the peripheral nervous system contains all the other nerves in the body, so everything minus the brain and the spinal cord, and is broken down further into somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. So the somatic nervous system controls voluntary movement so somatic nervous system connects nerve fibers to voluntary muscles and provides the brain with feedback about voluntary movement. So this would capture movement like a slap shot in hockey or a tennis swing. So where the somatic is voluntary, 
autonomic is involuntary. So autonomic, you can think automatic. Autonomic nervous system controls organs that operate involuntarily. involuntarily. So it connects the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord, to all internal organs over which people don't usually have control. Like we don't really have um, complete control over our kidneys or our stomach um, or our heart. We can't sit there and be like, mm, I'm making my heart do this right now. So the autonomic nervous system contains these things that we can't really control. So to regulate the autonomic nervous system, it's broken down even farther into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, and those regulate all of these um, internal organs. So I believe I mentioned these in the chapter one video and maybe even in my intro to health psych video, but here are your emergency response and after emergency response teams. So the sympathetic nervous system is your fight, flight, or freeze system, and it readies the body to respond to threat. So a threat may be perceived as different things for different people. Um, so a threat can include physical emergencies like an accident or an intruder or strenuous activity like strenuous exercise or strong emotions like when you feel um, heartbreak or fear or sadness or even excite like positive emotions like excitement. So anything that a body perceives as requiring additional resources for survival to get through. So for example, people with clinical anxiety disorders perceive numerous things as threatening, even if they're not necessarily threatening. So this would trigger the SNS when there's no valid threat. For example, um, and I apologize if this is true for anyone, if anyone has a fear of dogs, the SNS may be triggered when they see a dog. So I hope that wasn't the case, but um, if someone has a severe fear of dogs, possibly seeing mine on the other video could trigger that SNS, the sympathetic nervous system. When it's triggered, the body is mobilized for action. So your heart rate may increase because the body needs more blood, more energy. So to pump more blood through the body, you may sweat to regulate your heat and you may feel the urge to move. In contrast, the parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest system. So it maintains and restores equilibrium once the threat is passed. So when we talk about stress, we'll get into this a bit more, but no one can stay in that um, ready for battle sympathetic nervous system state forever. It's just, it's going to take all your resources. You're going to run out of gas. So once the threat is passed, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in to bring everything back down to normal. So the parasympathetic nervous system controls the activities of organs under normal circumstances and returns the body to this normal state after the SNS turns off. So your heart rate and body temperature will return to normal and you may resume notice of other body needs that were suppressed by the SNS. So um, when your fight or flight response or freeze response is kicked in, you're not gonna feel hungry or you're not gonna need to use the washroom because um, like in a primitive context, you're more focused on survival. You don't wanna be running from a saber toothed tiger and realize that you want a snack or you need to go pee. So when the SNS turns off and the PNS kicks in, these other body regulatory systems will kick back in and make themselves known. So I don't know if anyone's like me, but maybe you've needed to use the washroom and then something's happened, you've gotten distracted because um, it was more imminent right then. And then afterwards you're like, oh right, I'm hungry. I need to use the washroom. That's what's happening when your rest and digest PNS system comes back into play. So like I said, the, the central nervous system includes the brain. So we, ha and especially since this is psychology, have to spend some time talking about that. Um, to put it mildly, the brain is the command center of the body. So your brain is a switchboard, it's the hard drive, it's, it's the whole damn computer. So remember that the brain and the spinal cord form the central nervous system. The brain receives sensory impulses from the peripheral nervous system 
and sends motor impulses to the extremities and to the internal organs to carry out movement. So it basically takes in all this information that um, the peripheral nervous system is giving it and figures out what it means and tells you what to do with it. So for example, if you hold your hand over an open flame, your hand will start to hurt. And that's because the peripheral nervous system has sent information up to the brain that this is hot, this holding over it is gonna damage the skin, so here's some pain response to tell you, let's not do this, please move my hand. Um, the brain will send information back down, will take all this information in and send information back down for the hand to be withdrawn. So if we didn't have our brain, this information couldn't be computed. So it'd be like sending all the information up to headquarters and headquarters never getting the email. Nerve impulses can be sent, but not received or responded to. So for example, uh, this was on my mind because I've been watching old CSI because I've ran out of things to watch in quarantine. Um, one example is prater willi syndrome. So bas basically, and I'm not an expert, so this is a very blunt, basic description. Um, this prater willi syndrome impacts the feeling of hunger and fullness. So it's a genetic disorder with disruptions to the hypothalamus. So the person's brain doesn't receive signals that they're now full and satiated. So leading to near constant feelings of hunger. So here, the signal might be being sent up, like I ate, I ate a lot, I'm full, I'm not hungry anymore, um, but it's never received by the brain. So because of that, the hunger signal never shuts off. So that's an example of without the brain, there can still be signals going around, but they're not received. So um, you never get the message. So to put it mildly, the brain is complex and it has numerous parts. So we'll go through some of the major parts in this chapter. So to start, the brain can be separated into the midbrain, the hindbrain, the forebrain. Um, starting with the hindbrain, there's three major parts, the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. The medulla's job is to regulate heart rate, blood pressure, respiration. Information about the body's levels of carbon dioxide are received, and oxygen are received by the medulla and are used to adjust um, rate or respiration. So we'll get into this very shortly with the respiratory system. But for example, if oxygen is low and carbon dioxide is high, the respiratory rate will increase. So if you've been working out really hard or, I don't know, carrying something heavy and you're expelling more oxygen, you're not taking enough in, your respiratory rate is going to increase. That's why you might start panting. So the pawns are a link between the midbrain and the hindbrain and also help in controlling respiration. And last is the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, um, I might be aging myself, but there's a very old Dane Cook thing that I always hear talking about balance and it says it goes up to your cerebellum. And if it helps you to link it to humorous things, you might want to look that up. But it's always helped me remember that the cerebellum coordinates voluntary muscle movement, maintaining balance. Equilibrium, muscle tone, posture helps keep us upright and holding ourselves properly in a way that our body can um, stay healthy and function properly. So this is the piece of brain that's responsible for keeping you balanced. So damage to this area can result in tremors, loss of muscle tone, um, difficulty balancing. Moving on to the midbrain, here we have coordination of visual and auditory reflexes. So by this, we mean the body's response to visual and auditory stimuli. So for example, um, you can think of stimuli as anything coming into those senses, right? So when someone turns on the light suddenly, a visual reflex is to close your eyes, possibly raise your arms to shield your eyes from the sudden presence of light because you know, your pupils are way too big, it's taking in way too much visual stimuli. So the midbrain's responsible for triggering and coordinating these reflexes and this response. Further, the midbrain's a major pathway for sensor and motor impulses moving between the forebrain and the hindbrain. So mid, middle, things that have to go from hind to 
the forefront need to go through the midbrain and vice versa. So moving on to the forebrain, the forebrain is the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the cerebral cortex, um, and is basically the biggest chunk of the brain. So the thalamus is involved in the recognition of sensory stimuli and relaying sensory impulses to the cerebral cortex. So remember, all your senses, touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight, um, information taken in from any of those senses is recognized by the thalamus as information and is then relayed to the lobes of the cerebral cortex for interpretation. So we feel like there's something going on here. There's um, some sort of information. Let's relay it up for understanding and interpretation in a response. The hypothalamus regulates cardiac functioning, blood pressure, respiration, water balance, and appetites. And by appetite, we mean hunger and sexual appetites. So the hypothalamus plays a major role in making sure that these bodily functions aren't overacting or underacting. So going back to the uh, prader willi syndrome and how I said that it's um, a disorder of the hypothalamus, this condition appetite isn't regulated because the brain hasn't received that information. Further, the hypothalamus is an important transition center between the cerebral cortex, where thoughts are generated, and their impact on the internal organs. So an easy example is blushing. So um, people, there's some people more than others, but you know, if you've ever known someone who would turn red at anything, um, or if you can think of things that make you blush. So thinking that something embarrassing just happened to you or feeling embarrassed results in blood flow increase to the cheeks. So the thoughts of, holy crap, I'm embarrassed, or this is embarrassing, or remembering something embarrassing that happened, um, that's happening in the cerebral cortex. But through the transition with the hypothalamus, it's impacted the internal organs to result in that rosy cheek blushing response. So talking about the cerebral cortex, it's the largest part of the brain. So it's the four lobes of your brain, your occipital lobe, your frontal lobe, your parietal lobe, your temporal lobe. And it's involved in higher order intelligence, memory, personality, really what makes us humans and able to function and um, able to remember things and making us all ever so slightly different in our personality. Um, sensory information that comes from the peripheral areas of the body and is transmuted via the thalamus is interpreted by the cerebral cortex. So it tells you what all these sensory inputs mean. So we're not going to go into detail about the four lobes of the cerebral cortex, but they all have their own areas of memory storage or areas of association. So through these complex relationships, we're able to relate current sensations to past ones. So I remember when this happened before, um, or because this happened to me before, I know what to do now. Um, using this information to make future predictions. I don't want this to happen again, so next time I'm gonna do something different. And this is why our brains are capable of complex interpretations. So lastly, we have the limbic system, which is important for stress and emotional responses. So major components are the amygdala, the hippocampus, and parts of the hypothalamus. The amygdala is involved in the detection of threat, which later triggers the sympathetic nervous system. So when we talk about stress reaction or in, um, threat reactions, we'll talk about this more. Um, the hippocampus is involved in the detection of emotionally charged memories. So in which areas of the hypothalamus are also implicated. So when you think about memories that bring a huge emotional response, no matter what that emotion is, so a very positive one, like maybe um, your wedding day or graduating or something exciting happening or negative ones like a death or a loss, um, the hippocampus is involved in the detection of those memories. 
So kind of the theme of this chapter is let's go over these systems and now let's talk about what can go wrong and all the disorders that can happen. Um, so these won't be exhaustive lists, but some of the major ones. So starting with the nervous system, as you can see, there's quite a few disorders because the nervous system is so complex and there's so many components to it, and especially with how complex the brain is. Um, there's numerous health disorders that can arise and can impact the functioning of the brain, the nervous system, and obviously our way of life. So when you think about all the disorders of all the various systems that come up, you can think about how health psychology comes into play, because especially when these are chronic disorders, um, health psychologists can come in and help with your interpretation, your acceptance of the disorder, and how um, help you follow a treatment plan and adjust your life to meet that treatment plan, for instance. So the most common forms of neurological dysfunction are epilepsy and Parkinson's disease. Starting with epilepsy, it's a disease of the central nervous system and is usually idiopathic, which means there's no specific cause for the symptoms. It can't be attributed to one or a couple things. Epilepsy is marked by seizures and seizures can range in severity. So minor seizures might be unnoticeable, sometimes maybe just shifting of the eyes um, or just a person kind of blanking out for a minute and not being responsive. And those usually would be occurring internally, otherwise they'd be a bit more overt and obvious. And in contrast, ma major seizures can involve those violent bodily convulsions, irregular breathing, possibly even loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a chronic illness, which means it can't be cured, but is managed by medication, behavioral interventions. Um, some animals, like more specifically dogs, can be trained to sense when an epileptic seizure is about to come on, so the person can prepare. Cerebral palsy is like epilepsy in that it's chronic and it's managed, uh, but it's non it's non progressive, which means that it won't get it won't get worse over time, and it comes from brain damage that's caused by a disruption in oxygen supply. So this can happen um, during life, maybe from an accident, um, but the most common time that this interruption occurs is during childbirth. So cerebral palsy manifests as a lack of muscle control and can vary in severity. Next, we have Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is progressive, so means it gets worse over time. Uh, it's chronic and it's marked by degeneration of the basal ganglia. Now the basal ganglia is a group of nuclei in the brain, which is responsible for controlling smooth motor coordination. So I'm moving my hands in a smooth motion. I'm not tremoring or struggling to move. So due to this degeneration, individuals with Parkinson's experience tremors, rigidity, slowness of movement. Um, most commonly, Parkinson's develops in individuals aged 50 and older but it can develop at a younger age. The cause isn't really known, but there is evidence to suggest that dopamine, a neurotransmitter, might be involved. Um, so some of you might have heard or seen Michael J. Fox, so most famous for his roles in Back to the Future movies. Um, for a good example of living with Parkinson's um, or maybe what it looks like, you can check out um, his story in interviews. I think he has a memoir. Um, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I believe at a relatively young age, like much younger than the 50, um, and withdrew temporarily from acting due to the condition. And he'd be a really good example kind of of where the role of health psychology might come into play. I don't know if he actually worked with a health psychologist, but in that um, attitude and acceptance of the condition does a lot to impact um, success of treatment um, and the prognosis for your life going forward, especially with chronic conditions, because he had a really hard time accepting his condition and really struggled. And when he was able to um, come to a place where he can accept it and live with it, he returned to acting. Um, he salvaged the relationship with his family that he almost lost when he was really struggling 
um, and really bitter about what was going on. So he's a really good example of living with a chronic condition and the impact attitude and acceptance can take. So next we have multiple sclerosis, um, more commonly known as MS. Um, the cause of MS has been identified as a disintegration of myelin, which is the fatty membrane that surrounds and protects the nerve fibers, facilitating the conduction of nerve impulses. So in a nerve, um, the whole piece of the nerve, we have the myelin sheath surrounding, um, surrounding the nerve and the axon where the nerve impulses travel down. It needs to get from one end to the other to go out and be um, received by another neuron and so on and so forth, so the message can be received. When the myelin sheath, when myelin disintegrates, this protection is gone. And because of that, information that's traveling through a neuron could be interrupted. So it's almost like when you play telephone and it starts out as a really clear, crisp response. And by the time you get to the end, it doesn't make any, like it's nothing near what it originally was. Without myelin, it's kind of like that. The information can be interrupted, so maybe it com completely doesn't get through, or maybe it only half gets through, or a completely different message gets through. Um, but either way, this neural impulse hasn't made it through properly. So this is a progressive degenerative illness, and because of this impact on failed nerve impulse transmission, um, there's a, quite a large variety of symptoms people can experience. Um, paralysis, blindness, deafness, mental deterioration as well. And it is progressive and degenerative, but commonly people may experience almost a flare up of symptoms and then some symptom reduction for a period of time. Now, next we have Huntington's disease. And this is a hereditary, hereditary disorder of the central nervous system. And it's characterized by chronic physical and mental deterioration. So this disease has actually been genetically isolated. So they've been able to isolate the Huntington gene. And that means individuals can test for it. So a genetic test may reveal not only if you're a carrier and you're likely to develop Huntington's, but also what age the, you might be succumb to the disease. So um, I believe I mentioned this in chapter one, but this is a pretty big area for health psychologists to become involved because um, imagine taking this genetic test and finding out that you're gonna develop Huntington's and it's hard. So um, helping accept that and prep for that is a big area for health psychologists to come into play. Polio is a viral disease and it mostly impacts young children. Um, and in developed uh, countries, industrialized countries like the United States, Canada, the prevalence has really decreased. It's decreased worldwide, but especially in these countries because we have vaccines readily available for polio. Um, but the illness is still a major issue in developing countries, such as Pakistan, Afghanistan. Um, and this virus attacks the spinal nerves and destroys the cell bodies of motor neurons. So motor impulses can't be carried outward from the spinal cord. So symptoms can include difficulty walking, shrunken, ineffective limbs, and full paralysis. So paraplegia and quadriplegia, we can kind of combine when we're talking about them. They both involve paralysis of body, bodily extremities due to damage of the uh, spinal cord, but the difference is in um, which and how many extremities are paralyzed and what the damage is. So paraplegia occurs when the lower portion of the spinal cord is injured and manifests as a paralysis of the lower extremities of the body. So the trunk of the body and the upper extremities, the, the functioning of those is preserved. In comparison, quadriplegia occurs when the upper portion of the spinal cord is severed. And this results in paralysis of all four extremities and the trunk of the body. Lastly, we have dementia, and this is a progressive loss of cognitive ability, extending beyond the expectations of normal aging. So it's understandable to lose cognitive functioning as we age, um, but this is over and above what's expected. Now, dementia is not one illness, it's 
um, a category for various forms. Um, but in all forms of dementia, memory, attention, language, and problem solving are the areas of cognitive functioning that are most um, impacted earliest, and that's usually what would lead to assessment and diagnosis. So for example, um, classic uh, examples of a partner noticing that their loved one is forgetting where they put things, um, their attention is really off, they can't problem solve, that might lead them to go get assessed by a doctor. So the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's, which unfortunately is irreversible as the plaques and tangles appear in the brain, the brain progressively shrinks. Um, and unfortunately, diagnosis of Alzheimer's is really on the rise and, and dementia in general, um, with millions of people worldwide currently diagnosed. So this is a really big area of research right now into um, can we reverse it, can we prevent it? Because it is genetic as well. So individuals with a loved one who has Alzheimer's um, or dementia any, of any form um, has a higher chance of developing it themselves. And don't quote me on this, but I believe there might be genetic tests for that as well, but I could be wrong. So that was the nervous system. Moving on to the endocrine system. This complements the nervous system in controlling bodily activities, and it's comprised of ductless glands, which secrete hormones into the blood. And these hormones stimulate changes in their targeted organs. So the endocrine and the nervous systems work together to stimulate and inhibit each other's activities. So where the nervous system is primarily responsible for quick and temporary changes to the body. So if you think of your fight or flight response, um, endocrine system is responsible for long-term slow acting processes. So again, when we get into discussions about stress response, long-term stress and long-term stress response will um, include the endocrine system. Whereas short-term bear is chasing me, bear is no longer chasing me, is more, um, the SNS is more responsible with that. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland regulate the endocrine system, and the pituitary gland is split into two lobes, posterior pituitary and anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary gland, or pituitary lobe, produces oxytocin, which controls contractions during labor um, and is involved in social affiliation, which is the drive and motivation to seek social bonds. So for example, and if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm a crazy dog lady, so sorry, not sorry. I'm always gonna use dogs as examples. But for example, there's evidence demonstrating that looking at a dog, petting a dog, releases oxytocin. Um, so, you know, pet all the puppies. But it's that bond facilitating hormone that you're like, I like you, I wanna stick with you, I wanna keep you around, you're a good one. So the posterior pituitary lobe also is comprised of vasopressin, AKA antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And ADH controls the water absorbing ability of the kidneys, which keeps you optimally hydrated, which we'll get into a bit more. Now the anterior pituitary lobe secretes hormones responsible for growth. So among these, the somatotropic hormone regulates bone muscle and other organ development. Gonadotropic hormones control the growth, development, and secretions of the gonads, which are the testes and the ovaries. Thyrotropic hormone controls the growth, development, and secretion of the thyroid gland, which is very important for your metabolism. And last, adrenocortotropic hormone controls the growth, development, and secretion of the cortex region of the adrenal glands. So anterior pituitary is huge for growth, really. So when you look at disorders of the endocrine system, we're really looking at one major disorder, which is diabetes and can exist as either type one or type two. So diabetes is a chronic endocrine disorder and it manifests as an inability to either manufacture and or properly use insulin, which is a hormone that allows your body to use glucose. And by glucose, we mean sugar 
to for energy and it controls your blood sugar levels so type 1 diabetes is autoimmune which as we'll discuss at the end means your immune system like you basically it attacks itself and this usually arises in late childhood or early adolescence and is partly genetic in origin so um, compared to type 2 you can't really get type 1 by lifestyle choices with type 1 diabetes the immune system identifies falsely cells in the pancreas as invaders so the pancreas is responsible for the production of insulin so these pancreatic cells are destroyed excuse me and com which compromises and or eliminates their ability to pr produce insulin so insulin is either not produced enough or isn't produced at all Type 1 diabetes typically occurs after age 40, but it can um, occur sooner. And this is more seen as a disease of lifestyle and is the more common form of diabetes. So when we say a disease of lifestyle, uh, we mean that the risk factors are very common in lifestyle choices, like um, not exercising enough, not eating a healthy diet, being overweight so especially when we get into chapter three which talks a lot about health behaviors um and when we go into health compromising behaviors etc just know that these are uh, read just to be factual information and everything is specific to a specific human someone um can be quite overweight and not have even pre-diabetic issues have like no health issues people can be underweight and have the same issues so just note that these are just being read as general facts and um, to reserve judgment and to keep things just person specific and not over generalize these facts so as I was saying with type 2 insulin may be produced um, but there be because it's not autoimmune, it's not attacking the pancreatic cells, but there may be too little or the body may not be sensitive to its existence. So risk factors, like I said, include obesity, but can also include stress, um, resulting in recognition of this as a disease of lifestyle. And the more, I guess, positive note of type 2 diabetes is because it's a disease of lifestyle um, it can be managed with lifestyle changes and in some cases people have been able to um, reduce or reverse their symptoms even to like the pre-diabetic stages not in all cases but so moving on to the cardiovascular system this is comprised of the heart blood vessels and blood so the cardiovascular system acts as a transport system of the body with blood carrying everything. So blood carrying oxygen from the lungs to the tissues, carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs, nutrients from the digestive tract to the individual cells for growth and for energy, waste products from the cells to the kidneys for excretion, hormones from the endocrine glands to other organs of the body, and heat to the surface of the skin to control body temperature. So basically the blood is like our life force train. So to start with looking at the heart, it's a pump and it circulates blood through the body. The pumping action of the heart operates as a cycle and each side of the heart has an atrium and a ventricle involved in this cycle. So starting with the left side, the left side of the heart takes in oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it out into the aorta, which is a major artery, from which the blood passes into smaller vessels to reach cell tissues. So it pumps the oxygenated blood out to go to your blood, or I mean, sorry, to go through your tissues and the rest of your body. Once blood has done its thing, been pumped out, gone wherever it needed to go, and made its various exchanges of oxygen and nutrients for waste and CO2, it returns to the heart via the right side. So it goes out, it does its thing, it gives its oxygen, its hormones, its nutrients, and while it's making its exchanges, it takes the leftover. So it takes the waste, it takes the carbon dioxide, and then comes back to the right side of the heart, where it's pumped back into the lungs to be reoxygenated and sent back out through the left side of the heart. 
So this cycle is performed through the contraction and relaxation of the heart muscles, that thump thump that you hear in your chest, which is called the cardiac cycle. This cycle consists of two phases, systole and diastole. In systole, blood is pumped out of the heart, which increases pressure in the blood vessels because it's shooting blood out into those vessels. During diastole, the muscle relaxes and blood pressure drops because blood is being taken back into the heart for that reoxygenation. This flow of blood is controlled by valves at the inlet and outlet of each ventricle. So when you look at the diagram, you can see the ventricles and there'll be valves opening and closing. And this ensures that blood flows only in one direction. So out through the left, back in through the right. And this is that sound you hear, that thump thump, the opening and the closing of those valves. So this cardiac cycle has, in, in every person, has its natural state and its natural rate, but it is influenced by external forces. So when you're sleeping, your heart rate slows because you're not moving, your body doesn't need as much energy. And there's times where it needs more energy, so it speeds up your heart rate and speeds up this process. So exercise, excitement, stress, um, when the SNS is activated for threat, and when it returns to a normal pace with the PNS. Um, so it's very, it has its natural state and it adjusts itself to what your body needs at a certain time. Now, of course, there's several disorders of the cardiovascular system. So disorders may arise due to conge congenital defects, which means they're present at birth or due to infection or lifestyle factors. Lifestyle factors like smoking, diet, stress, lack of exercise are generally the largest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Atherosclerosis is our first dis disorder and it's caused by deposits of cholesterol and other substances on the arterial walls. So this results in the formation of plaques narrowing of the arteries and this restricts the flow of blood and with that the flow of everything important that's in the blood like oxygen and nutrients throughout the body and this can result in arterial damage as well. So damaged arteries are potential sites for blood clots and this can further obstruct and even cut off the flow of blood. So atherosclerosis is associated with three main clinical manifestations. So angina pectoris is um, commonly known as chest pain. And the heart in this case has an insufficient supply of oxygen or inadequate removal of carbon dioxide and other waste products. So because these arterial walls are thickened and it's restricted blood flow, the good stuff can't um, get into the heart, the bad stuff can't get out, into the lungs. Uh, myocardial infarction, or MI, is known as a heart attack in layman's terms, and this is when a clot has developed in a coronary vessel which blocks the flow of blood to the heart, so it's basically starving the heart. And lastly, ischemia, characterized by a lack of blood flow and oxygen to the heart muscle, and this can be a precursor to a heart attack and may occur without the individual's awareness. So my experience, some chest pain, some tightness, not really know what's going on. Other major cardiovascular disorders can include congestive heart failure, which is the heart's delivery of oxygen-rich blood is inadequate, starving the body of oxygen and nutrients. So in this case, the heart just isn't functioning well enough to do its job. So it's kind of like the blood train isn't getting enough gas or coal or whatever to get out to the body. So then the rest of the body is kind of starving for what it needs. And arrhythmia is irregular beatings of the heart. And this can lead to loss of consciousness and sudden death, sometimes with absolutely no warning. So because we've been talking about the heart um, and how important blood is, we need to talk about blood pressure and then what blood is. 
So the force of blood against the blood vessel walls fluctuates with the cardiac cycle. And this is what this force is what um, we consider blood pressure. So blood pressure is highest, as I said, during systole, when all the blood is being pumped out of the heart. And it's lowest during diastole, when blood is returning to the heart. Now, just like how several factors can influence the cardiac cycle, several factors can influence blood pressure. The most notable is cardiac output or the volume of blood flow, right? So the more blood that's being pushed through, the higher the blood pressure, the less, the lower the blood pressure. Um, if you take your, for example, if you take your blood pressure after an intense run, it's going to be high because your body needed the additional oxygen and nutrients to fuel itself, right? Um, a second factor would be peripheral resistance, which means any resistance to blood flow in the arteries of the body, in the small arteries. And this is affected by how many red blood cells and how much plasma are in the blood. And last, blood pressure is influenced by the structure of the arterial walls. So when we were talking about diseases of the cardiovascular system, if there's any damage or blockages, blood pressure will be higher. Um, because it's not getting through properly. So with that, what is blood? Other than, than you know, that red stuff that it comes out of us. So as an adult, we have a lot of blood. We have about five liters of blood in our body. And our blood is made up of plasma and cells. So blood's very complicated. There's actually a lot to our blood. So plasma is the fluid portion of blood accounting for over half the blood volume. And plasma contains plasma proteins, plasma electrolytes, and um, electrolytes means salts, and the substances transported by the blood. So oxygen, nutrients, waste, hormones, etc. The rest of the blood is the blood cells, and these are suspended in the plasma. Blood cells are manufactured in our bone marrow, and this contains five types of blood forming cells. Myeloblasts and monoblasts produce the white blood cells. Lymphoblasts produce lymphocytes. Erythroblasts produce red blood cells. And megakerocytes produce platelets. Now, white blood cells are imperative for healing the body by absorbing and removing foreign substances. An elevated white blood cell count can suggest the presence of an infection. That's one of the first things that they'll check for when they're trying to see if you have an infection. Lymphocytes produce antibodies, which destroy foreign substances. So together, lymphocytes and white blood cells are critical for fighting infection and disease. Red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which is needed to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if you've ever donated blood, one of the first things they'll do is check your hemoglobin levels because they need to know it's high enough for you to be able to sacrifice your blood and for your blood to be viable for carrying the oxygen and carbon dioxide. And lastly, platelets block small holes that develop in blood vessels and are very important for clotting. So platelets um, can both possibly help and hinder if there's overclotting, right? If you have an overclotting or an underclotting disease. So moving on, our next system is the respiratory system. So by respiratory, we mean breathing, which is very important. So there are three main functions to breathing. We take in oxygen, we excrete carbon dioxide, and regulate the composition of the blood. So inspiration, so breathing in, brings in oxygen. Expiration, breathing out, eliminates CO2. So through the process of inspiration, air is inhaled through the nose and through the mouth, passing through to the trachea, which is a muscular tube extending downward, and it divides in the chest cavity at its lower end to two branches known as the primary bronchi. So each bronchus enters the lung and divides further into secondary bronchi, smaller bronchioles, and finally microscopic alve alveolar ducts. So inspiration is active, right? Like just think about breathing in, your chest gets bigger. It's a very active process. 
the contraction of the muscles, expanding of the lungs and the chest wall. In contrast, expiration is passive, involving the relaxation of the lungs, reducing their volume. So if you remember the medulla from the brain, it contains a respiratory center and controls these respiratory movements. So this center relies on the chemical composition of the blood to indicate respiratory levels. So if the CO2 level is too high, respiration will increase because you need more oxygen and vice versa. If there's, um, if like I said, when you're exercising and your respiration rate goes up, it's to regulate and add more oxygen into your blood. So for disorders of the respiratory system, probably one of the most commonly known ones is asthma. And that can, is really a, just a severe allergic reaction and typically to a foreign substance, um, quite often environmental. So dust, pollen, animal dander, um, sometimes for some people humidity because the air is thicker can be difficult for people with asthma. Um, with me, for example, my asthma hates cold air because the air is thinner. Um, so a lot of times I have to be quite careful when I go outside, which is interesting because I'm from Northern Ontario where it's always cold. Um, asthma attacks can be triggered also by things like emotional stress um, and intense anxiety, exercise, because in these cases, the respiratory system already is heightened in these, in these um, instances. So when an asthma attack happens, um, muscles around the air tubes construct or constrict, the lining of the air tubes is inflamed and increased mucus is produced. So all of these things are really constricting and inhibiting your ability to take in air and even to let air out, right? So expel carbon dioxide and take in oxygen. So these factors all clog the air tubes and make breathing very difficult. Viral and bacterial infections may impact the respiratory system. So for example, the common cold is a viral infection and impacts the upper, sometimes the lower respiratory tract. Um, this virus has an in incubation period, which means um, the time between when you're exposed to the virus and when you first get symptoms. So with the common cold, the incubation period is 12 to 72 hours on average. Um, another form of viral infection is bronchitis, and this impacts the respiratory system with the mucosal membrane inside the bronchi of the lungs becoming inflamed, which produces large amounts of mucus, which leads to that persistent, um, often very phlegmy cough that people with bronchitis have. So in comparison to viral infections, bacterial infections are less likely to cause permanent damage or any damage uh, to the respiratory tract. But however, just like with viral infections, there's a concern for secondary infection because your immune system is already pretty taxed fighting the original issue and there's just lessened resistance to additional infections. So there's also a risk for permanent damage, not to the respiratory tract, but to other areas like the heart tissue. So examples of bacteria infections can be strep throat and whooping cough. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is better known as COPD. Um, you'll probably see lots of commercials out there for COPD medication. And it includes illnesses like having chronic bronchitis, emphysema, um, COPD is commonly brought about by lifestyle conditions, like a lot of smokers can develop COPD. Um, smoking accounts for over 80% of the cases of COPD, and it's quite deadly. So in the United States, COPD is the fourth leading cause of death. Pneumonia may take different forms, but their primary types are either lober and bronchial. In lower pneumonia, an entire lobe of a lung is infected, hence lober. In bronchial pneumonia, as the name suggests, the infection is confined to the bronchi. So in pneumonia, the normal oxygen CO2 exchange is disrupted and the alveoli are inflamed. So with pneumonia, there's a large concern for infection to spread to other organs. 
So tuberculosis, TB, is an infectious disease caused by bacteria invading lung tissue. Um, through the bacteria invasion, cavities can be produced in the lungs, which leads to permanent scar tissue. Uh, the scar tissue can cause chronic breathing difficulties. Um, and in the United States and Canada, TB has been largely eradicated. We have a vaccine for it. Um, but if anyone's ever had to get like a health check, um, a health screening for a job, might have had to get a TB skin test. Um, it's still very common worldwide, so especially if you've traveled to more developing areas, you might be at risk of having contracted TB. So on a related note, pleurisy is an inflammation of the pleura, which is the membrane surrounding the organs in the chest cavity. So this is quite painful because it's supposed to surround and protect and insulate these organs in your chest cavity, but that inflammation is going to be quite agitated anytime your chest cavity expands or restricts with breathing. So it can be quite painful for people that get it, and it's usually a common consequence of TB or pneumonia. And lastly, we have lung cancer, which is a chronic illness characterized by uncontrolled cell growth tissues in the lungs. So cancer cells divide at an unrestricted manner quite rapidly, which creates a tumor. And because malignant, malignant cells grow faster than healthy cells, there's a concern for metastitis, which is the invading of adjacent tissue and infiltration of the malignant cells beyond the lungs. So when the cancer spreads to other areas. As with COPD, smoking is one of the primary causes of lung cancer. All right, so for the digestive system, we are halfway there. So moving down, the digestive system is responsible for converting food into energy and heat and the supply of nutrients for cells through metabolism. So with digestion, food passes through the esophagus down toward the stomach. In the stomach, gastric secretions are produced, including pepsin and hydrochloric acid, which break down the food for further digestion. So ever felt like you were drooling at the smell of a delicious meal? That's actually a real thing. And that's because the digestive system can be triggered um, just by the sight, the smell, even the thought of food. So, you know, when a holiday period comes like Thanksgiving and you're thinking about turkey, like your um, family's famous turkey or something. For me, it's my aunt's mashed potatoes. She makes them with tzatziki instead of um, margarine or cream. It's amazing. So you can just the smell or the thought of that can be enough to trigger my digestive system. So in the process of digestion, food passes from the stomach down to the duodenum, which is the intersection of the stomach and the lower intestine. So here, the pancreas, which remember produces insulin, becomes involved and it secretes pancreatic juices to break down the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the fats. And um, because insulin is made here, it facilitates the entry of the glucose or the sugars into the tissues. The liver also gets involved here by producing bile to break down the fats. Moving down further, food moves into the small intestine where the majority of food absorption occurs. So the nutrients and everything from the food are absorbed into the body. The small intestine produces enzymes that complete the breakdown of proteins into amino acids. The mobility of the small intestine is controlled by the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Parasympathetic speeds up metabolism, sympathetic slows it down. So your body is not concerned about breaking down food when facing a threat. Hence, rest and digest for the parasympathetic. Food then passes into the large intestine, which largely acts as a storage organ, and the reabsorption of water happens here. Um, remaining leftovers um, are developed into fecal matter, which enters into the rectum and is expelled through solid waste. So disorders of the digestive system, one of the most common is gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease or GERDs, and this is better known as um, acid reflux. So this occurs as abdominal reflux in the esophagus, often due to changes in the barrier between the esophagus and the stomach. 
like failure to adequately close and protect the throat from the stomach acids. Um, this is quite common. Um, like majority of people may have had acid reflux at one point in their life, maybe especially when they've eaten spicy foods. Um, but with GERDs, it's much more um, chronic for the individual. Gastroenteritis is an inflammation of the stomach lining and the small intestine. So this may occur from eating too much food or maybe from food poisoning from contaminated food or water. Symptoms usually appear within hours of the ingestion of food and can um, include vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, nausea. So um, good old fashioned food poisoning can generally lead to this. So speaking of diarrhea, um, it's characterized, I think most of us probably know what diarrhea looks like, watery, infrequent bowel movements. So from a biological standpoint, this happens when the intestines can't absorb the water or food properly, like, maybe, like um, can't absorb enough of the water to create like a solid stool. Isolated incidents of diarrhea are usually unfortunate, but and, and uncomfortable and kind of, you know, smelling gross, but relatively harmless. However, serious and or chronic diarrhea can be health jeopardizing because you're, um, if the water isn't being absorbed, you can be quite dehydrated. So this is um, a result of serious fluid and or electrolyte imbalances and is a quite a common cause of death in developing countries. Related is dysentery. So it's similar to diarrhea, but this is where mucus, pus, and blood um, are in the excrement. So if you've ever, you know, maybe even a pet or you or a loved one uh, have ever been really concerned because you've seen blood in your stool, that's when it's dysentery. Um, so this, along with diarrhea, can be quite life-threatening in developed countries where they don't have as much medical attention. A peptic ulcer is an open sore in the lining or the stuff of the stomach or the duodenum, resulting from hypersecretion of hydrochloric acid. Um, so as you recall from chapter one, ulcers were once thought to be primarily psychological in origin. So if you ever heard um, the brain fart, the term, <laughs> don't stress, you're gonna give me an ulcer. Um, that comes from the old belief that ulcers were quite psychological. But we now know that ulcers may be aggravated by stress, but aren't caused by stress. So if you already have ulcers and you get stressed, it's going to make it worse. So appendicitis, appendicitis is a very painful condition, can confirm, um, that occurs when waste and bacteria accumulate in the appendix. So if the small opening of the appendix is obstructed, um, the, there's a lot of pain, peristal peristalsis, and nausea. And if the appendix is severely agitated and enlarged because the bacteria is just stuck in there multiplying, it can rupture. And if it ruptures, all that stored bacteria is released into the abdominal cavity. And um, this can be uh, excruciatingly painful, even more so than the inflamed appendix. And it's very life-threatening because of the release of all this bacteria, which could lead to severe infection and even death if it's not caught soon enough. And lastly, we have hepatitis, which means inflammation of the liver and produces swelling and tenderness and sometimes permanent damage. So symptoms of hepatitis can include jaundice, which is where um, if your liver is not functioning properly, there's a yellowing of the skin, even the eyes, uh, fatigue, fever, muscle, joint aches, um, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, diarrhea. So there are five different types of hepatitis identified by the letters A to E. So hep A is caused by viruses and is transmitted typically through contaminated food and water. Hep B is a more serious form and also known as serum hepatitis. And it's caused by a virus transmitted by the transfusion of infected blood, um, improperly sterilized needles, sexual contact, um, mothered infant contact. So there has to be contact of, and exchange of bodily fluids in some way. Hep C is spread also by blood and needles, 
and is most commonly caused by blood transfusions. Hep D is found mainly in intravenous drug users who also have Hep B. And last, Hep E is similar to Hep A, but is caused by a different form of virus. All right, on to the renal system. So this is comprised of the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. So this is um, all boils down to the expulsion of fluid waste. So the kidneys are incredibly important and regulate body fluids and produce urine. Ureters contain smooth muscle tissue, which contracts to move the urine down to the bladder. And the bladder is a, a muscular bag that's just a reservoir for the urine. And once the bladder, um, once in the bladder, the urethra conducts the urine from the bladder out to the body. So urine contains our liquid waste, like I said, so surplus water, surplus electrolytes, waste products from food, surplus acids or alkalis. Um, so basically say um, all those supplements that are out there like vitamin this, vitamin that, here take this, take that for all these things. If your body doesn't actually need it, it will just go out with your urine. So surplus anything. If your body is maxed out and it's good and it doesn't need anymore, it's just gonna get filtered out through the urine. So by disposing of these waste products, a balance is maintained of your water, your electrolytes, your blood pH, because your blood can't be too acidic or um, uh, basic. Because water balance is so important, the kidneys are invaluable as they control water balance in the body. So more urine is produced when there's excess water and it, production is reduced when the body is dehydrated and water needs to be preserved. So for example, think of how much water you need to drink when you're sweating, like maybe on a hot day or if you're exercising, but how little you need to use the washroom because your body actually needs that water. Now in comparison, if there's a day that maybe you just drank a lot of water and how often you had to go to the bathroom because you didn't need it. So disorders of the renal system. Um, a common one is urinary tract infections or UTIs. Then we have glomerular nephritis, tubular necrosis, and kidney failure. So UTIs are very common, especially among women, and can result in significant pain and lead to more serious infections if left untreated. Particularly in women, they can, women, they can lead to serious infections, um, or sorry, anyone with a gynecological reproductive system. Um, can lead to more serious infections and possibly compromise fertility. Glomerular nephritis involves the inflammation of the glomeruli in the nephrons of the kidneys that filter blood. So what this means is nephrons are the basic structural and functional units of the kidneys um, and inflammation and damage to these nephrons can result in poor blood filtration um, and is linked to many deaths worldwide. So this can be caused by infections, exposure to toxins, and by autoimmune diseases, so especially lupus, which we'll um, discuss in a little bit. Tubular necrosis is a common cause of renal shutdown and involves disrupt destruction of the epithelial cells in the tubes of the kidneys. So the most common causes of tubular necrosis are poisons and severe circulatory shock. And last, but definitely not least, we have kidney failure. So this is understandably a very severe condition because the inability to produce a proper amount of urine will cause the retention of various waste products in the body. So to combat kidney failure, individuals may receive an artificial kidney, um, undergo a kidney transplant, or kidney dialysis, um, which helps to facilitate the cleansing of the blood and removing waste products. All right, and our final system is the reproductive system. So the system's development is controlled by the pituitary gland. So recall that the anterior pituitary produces gonadotropic hormones, which control the development of the ovaries and testes. Um, so I caught myself a few minutes ago, but note that your textbook utilizes this binary distinction of you know ovaries as female sex characteristics and testes as male sex characteristics. But in an effort to be 
um, non-binary non inclu and inclusive. I'm not going to use these labels, um, but just so you're aware of that, that's how the textbook's written, so it may come up on exam questions. Um, especially if I, like, I'll try to catch it and adjust it, but just so you know what the textbook's saying and what I mean when I don't use those terms. Um, so the ovaries, to start with the gynecological reproductive system, the ovaries contain the ova, which is the eggs. So an egg is discharged each month into the fallopian tubes to be fertilized by sperm. And if the egg is not fertilized, it'll stay in the uterine cavity for about two weeks, at which point it will be discharged along with the uterine endometrium during menstruation. So the uterine walls will thicken to be able to hold and encase a fertilized egg. And if fertilization doesn't occur, that'll all be shedded out. In addition to ovulation, the ovaries produce um, the hormones estrogen and progesterone. So estrogen is imperative for the development of sex characteristics, including breasts and distribution of body fat and body hair. In comparison, progesterone is produced during the second half of the menstrual cycle to prepare the body for pregnancy. Now, if there is no pregnancy, if an egg is not fertilized, progesterone will decline. In males, testosterone, or in individuals with uh, testes, testosterone is produced here under the control of the anterior pituitary gland. Testosterone brings about sperm production and the development of sex characteristics like facial hair, muscle growth, and deepening of the voice. So, as with all the other systems of the body, we unfortunately have a variety of diseases that can be contracted in the reproductive system. The most common disorders would be sexually transmitted diseases or STDs. And as the name suggests, STDs occur during sexual activities, but are not limited to sexual intercourse. So any type of sexual interaction can run the risk for STDs. Types include herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis, genital warts, chlamydia, and AIDS. In individuals with a gynecologic reproductive system, so ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, an additional concern from STDs is chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. So this may produce severe abdominal pain and can result in infections that can compromise fertility. Individuals with a gynecologic reproductive system also may experience disorders of the menstrual cycle. So these disorders may include amenorrhea, which is an absence of menses, so you don't get your period, and oligomenorrhea, which is infrequent menstruation. So amenorrhea is common among individuals with low body fat and low body weight, maybe like professional athletes, um, and it's a common side effect of restrictive uh, eating disorders. Because if the body believes that it's not at a healthy state, it'll start pretty much shutting down any extras. So um, it's not really concerned about you being fertile if it doesn't think that you're in a healthy state for your own survival. Gynecologic and testicular cancers are also a concern. So gynecologic cancers may include cervical, ovarian, and endometrial cancer, which is in the uterus. Although not necessarily a consequence of a singular disorder, fertility problems are very common with approximately 10% of US couples experiencing fertility problems. Because a lot can quote unquote go wrong in the attempt to fertilize an egg right because you have two complex reproductive systems that need to be optimally um, functioning to lead to proper fertilization so fertility problems are defined as an inability to conceive a pregnancy if there's been a year of regular intercourse without contraception or without birth control so if you've been trying for a year without any sort of birth control and you still have not produced a pregnancy you can um, be defined as having some form of fertility issues. So fortunately, there's various methods of technology to nowadays to assist individuals with conceiving a child. The most common is called in vitro fertilization or IVF, in which egg and sperm are combined outside the body uh, before being implanted in the uterus. 
So if you can successfully complete the fertilization, um, for a lot of people, that's the biggest issue is the fertilization and then um, can be implanted in the uterus, which will increase um, likelihood of pregnancy. So success rate is can be as high as 40%. Unfortunately, um, depending on the country you live in, um, the means that you have, the healthcare coverage, um, fertility um, assistance can be quite expensive and hard for people to obtain. So, as you're now aware, there are a lot of diseases that can occur in various bodily systems. Um, so, there's a lot of things that can influence the possibility that you might contract or develop a disease. And genetics are one potential indicator of whether someone's susceptible to a disease. Research has been conducted on animals, like rats, to determine factors that contribute to the development and maintenance of diseases. In humans, um, the main types of research used to determine whether a disease characteristic is genetically acquired are things like family, twin, and adoption studies. So family studies may be used to investigate where, whether members of the same family are likely to develop a disorder compared to unrelated individuals in a similar environment. So um, for example, are members of a family more likely to develop heart disease than non-related individuals living in the same home? If a factor is genetically determined, unrelated individuals will be less likely to show the factor than related individuals. So if you and your family have a roommate, if um, you guys are more likely to develop a condition compared to the roommate, even though you're all living in the same home, that means it likely has a higher genetic component. Twin studies are incredible at providing invaluable information into the genetic basis of a disease. And there are two types of twins. So monozygotic are identical twins, which occur when a single egg has split. And in comparison, dizygotic or fraternal twins occur when two eggs are fertilized. So fraternal twins share half their DNA and are like as far as DNA is concerned, they're the same as regular siblings that weren't born at the same time, but identical twins share their entire DNA. So if a characteristic is genetically transmitted, because identical twins share their whole DNA, they'll be more likely to share the condition compared to fraternal twins. So twins are studied also when they're reared together, so in the same home, or in instances when they're reared apart. So if attributes emerge for twins reared apart, they're likely more genetic in origin because they weren't sharing the same household environment. And lastly, we have adoption studies, which are useful because in these cases, a child that shares no DNA with their caretaker or caretakers um, are sharing a same household. So they share no ge genetics, but have the same environment. So adopted children won't manifest genetically based characteristics from their caretaker because they don't share DNA. So factors that an adopted child shares with their caretaker are more likely environmental in origin and not genetic. So the last bit that we need to discuss is the idea of your immune system and your immunity. So for a disease to take hold, it must resist our existing immunities, even if it's genetic. Just because it's genetic doesn't mean you have a 100% chance. It basically needs to get through. So further, our immune system is necessary to fight existing infections when they get there. So a disease may be transmitted via a variety of factors. Um, direct transmission involves bodily contact, like handshaking and such. So because it's so um, prevalent and in your face right now, we can use COVID-19 as an example. So if you think of the precautions, first thing to go was uh, shaking hands. Um, to protect yourself. You don't want to have direct contact with someone. Indirect transmission doesn't require bodily contact. So it's passed via airborne particles like dirt, water, soil, food. And another example is particles coming from person to person like coughing or sneezing. So this is why with social distancing, we're having to keep six meters apart so any air particles don't travel from person to person. And that's why masks are now being recommended, because although they don't protect you from contracting the illness, if you're carrying something and you sneeze or cough or talk, um, it can't get through the mask and get to someone else. 
Biological transmission is things like ticks and mosquito bites. Um, so when a transmitting agent picks up the microbe um, and by picking it up and having it in its own system, it's changed into a form that can now grow in the human body and then passes them on to a human. So a good example would be Lyme disease from a tick bite, for example. And finally, we have mechanical transmission. And this is when a microbe is passed to an individual by means of an indirect carrier. So a carrier that really actually isn't part of the process in any way, just happened to be the um, male, like the disease mailman, for lack of a better word, or deliverer. So compared to biological transmission, where if that tick or that mosquito had not picked up the microbe, it wouldn't have been transmitted into something that could grow in the human body. So it was an active member in the process. Mechanical transmission is things like bad water, um, rats, flies, because um, they were just carrying it. So what is infection? Not everyone who, re who receives an invading microbe will develop an infection. You could be bit by a tick carrying Lyme disease and not develop Lyme disease. The development of an infection depends on how many organisms were transmitted, um, their virulence or their severity, meaning their severity, and your body's defensive capabilities. So like young adult, healthy individuals are more likely to have adequate defensive capabilities compared to young children, the elderly, and or those who are already ill or have a compromised immune system. Diet and exercise have a significant impact on our immune system and our ability to fight off disease, which we'll discuss later, like in health promoting behaviors. Um, additionally, stress has a significant impact on our defensive capabilities. So if the invading organism gets in, gets into our body, gets a foothold, there's now a specific course that the infection will follow. So first we have the incubation period, which is the time between the contraction of the infection and the development of symptoms. So the incubation period will be different depending on the illness. You can remember with the common cold, the incubation period was 12 to 72 hours. Second, nonspecific symptoms will be the first to appear. So they're nonspecific because they're general and they can be attributed to a lot of different things and may not be a clear indicator of the actual illness. So this can be headaches, general discomfort, muscle aches. This is why people might go a while with having an illness and feeling unwell, but not having any idea that it's anything more serious because it's a headache. A headache can be anything. Did you have too much caffeine, not drink enough water, sit in front of a computer for too long? So it's not generally an indicator that there's um, something specific in your body. But what's happening when these nonspecific symptoms are coming up um, is that the microbes of the disorder are colonizing and producing toxins and multiplying and really setting up camp in your body. And this will lead to the development of the disorder and its disorder specific symptoms. So the specific symptoms and disorder onset will come up in the acute phase. So symptoms will reach their height during this phase. So basically the climax and the worst it will be during this phase. But good news is unless it's fatal, symptoms will eventually decline. So what goes up must come down. So symptoms will decline and abate as the microbes are expelled from the mouth, from the nose as saliva and mucus and through the digestive tract and renal system as feces and urine. So as your body fights it off and all that waste is expelled, you'll start to get better. So our immunity is our resistance to invading organisms. Immunity can either be natural or artificial. So natural means it was acquired either from your parent at birth through breastfeeding um, or through getting a disease. So when we're born and when we breastfeed, we receive natural immunity that that parent has. So their immunity is passed to us for certain things. That's why um, there can be concerns with having to use formula instead. Again, I'm not an expert. There's a lot of things to help in this area now, um, but you know there could be concerns about losing the natural immunity that come from the breast milk. 
So there needs to be supplements for that if the parent can't produce or whatever the reason may be. So immunities that are required through disease exist because as our immune system fights infection, it becomes equipped and to prevent further infection from the same microbe. So basically our immune system becomes wise to whatever that disease, whatever that microbe is, so that, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You're not gonna get me twice. So for example, we rarely get the chicken pox twice because our first exposure results in an immunity to the virus. So obviously this isn't foolproof. Some people can get things twice. Um, and sometimes I think things can mutate, so it can happen later on. So um, people can get shingles, which is a variant of chicken pox virus. Um, but because you know getting chicken pox is worse when you're adults um, and shingles and things like that, parents might um, actually kind of want their child to get things like the chicken pox when they're young to make sure they've got that immunity. So compared to that, artificial immunity is acquired through vaccinations and inoculations. So things like hepatitis, smallpox, meningitis vaccines, um, that's artificial immunity. So we didn't have it when we were born. We're not getting, we don't, maybe the disease is too deadly or too contagious. You don't want to get it once. Um, so we now have an immunity for it. We were able to isolate it. But either way, without this artificial agent, we wouldn't have the immunity. So some of the aforementioned diseases are significant contributors to death and illness in developing countries are because, maybe because of lack of vaccinations in other countries. So availability to healthcare, um, access to the means, financial access, things like that. So what is immunity? Immunity works through a lot of different mechanisms. Um, Non-specific immune mechanisms are a general set of responses to any kind of infection or disorder. So as the name suggests, these cells don't defend against a specific pathogen, but against many. So they're not um, the chicken pox immune um, cell. They defend against a bunch of different stuff. So these may occur through anatomical barriers which prevent the passage from one section of the body to another. So the most obvious example is your skin. It's preventing things from outside from getting through your skin. Blood-brain barrier is another one. So the blood-brain barrier, a lot of infections can get into our brain quite easily. Um, another thing is phagocytosis, which in which phagocytes, certain white blood cells, ingest the invading microbes. Antimicrobial substances are chemicals produced by the body to kill invading microorganisms. Examples can include hydrochloric acid, interferon. Lastly, inflammatory responses occur in a local area to fight infection. At the site, blood capillaries enlarge, histamines are released into the area, and this chemical allows white blood cells to enter the tissues to attack the microbes. So individuals such as myself with environmental allergies may ingest antihistamines to reduce an overactive um, allergic reaction. So like things like reactin can be a form of antihistamine. Now, compared to nonspecific, specific immunity comes after birth by contracting a disease or by artificial means like vaccinations. So it operates with the antigen antibody reaction. Now that is where antigens are foreign substances and their presence stimulates the production of antibodies. So their presence triggers the antibodies in the cell tissue. The antibodies combine with the antigens to overcome the toxic effects. Specific immunity is slower than non-specific immunity and as the name suggests is specific to certain types of antigens. Almost there. Humoral and cell-mediated immunities are immunologic reactions. Humoral, hi, hello, no thank you. Humoral immunity is mediated by B lymphocytes, which provide protection against bacteria, neutralize toxins produced by bacteria, and prevent viral reinfection, so you don't get the same virus twice. I made it so long without interruptions. 
and prevent viral reinfection so you don't get the same virus twice. They confer immunity by the production and secretion of antibodies. In comparison, cell-mediated immunity involves T lymphocytes from the thalamus gland, and it's slower than humoral immunity because it operates at the cellular level. When stimulated by the appropriate antigen, the cells secrete chemicals that kill invading micro microorganisms and, invaded and the infected cells. So finally, we have the lymphatic system, which is a drainage system of the body involved in the immune system functioning. Lymphatic tissue cells exist through, like, throughout the body, which contains lymphatic capillaries, vessels, and nodes. So if you ever heard of your lymph nodes. The lymphatic capillaries drain water, proteins, microbes, and other foreign materials from the spaces between the cells into the lymph vessels. The materials conducted to the lymph nodes to filter out microbes and foreign materials for ingestion by the lymphocytes. Any remaining substances are then drained into the blood to be transported back to the heart as waste. So the lymphatic system is very important for the drainage of waste and um, any invading micro microbes in the body. So our last part that I'm going to cover in the lecture material are the disorders related to the immune system. AIDS is the first one to mention, and it's a progressive impairment of immunity, which leaves the individual extraordinarily vulnerable to infection. So because the immune system is um, impaired, it's not functioning properly, and you're very vulnerable to invading um, microbes that could create like compiling infections in the body and really run rampant without much of a defense. Lupus leads to chronic inflammation of the tissues, which produces significant pain, heat, wellness, redness, and swelling. So if lupus attacks the connective tissue inside of the body's internal organs, it may be fatal. And lupus is an autoimmune disease, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Tonsillitis and infections of mononucleosis are infections that attack lymphatic tissue. So tonsillitis is an inflammation of the tonsils, which interferes with their ability to filter bacteria. A tonsillectomy, which is the removal of the tonsils, is quite common nowadays if people get chronic tonsillitis. Infectious mononucleosis is a viral disorder marked by a large number of monocytes. So symptoms can include an enlargement of the spleen and of the lymph nodes, fever, sore throat, and fatigue. Lymphoma is a form of tumor of the lymphatic tissue. And if you recall that there are lymphatic, or the, there's lymphatic tissue all throughout your body, so it's very vulnerable to very fast spreading of this form of cancer. So a specific form is Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin's lymphoma, which can be fatal because it involves the progressive enlargement of the lymph nodes, spleen, and lymphatic tissues, which impairs their ability to produce antibodies. So not only can it spread very quickly, it impairs your ability to fight off infection. So the last little bit is the idea of autoimmunity, which is basically when the body is confused as to what's a threat and what's a friendly, and the body attacks its own tissues because it doesn't recognize its own tissue as its own and identifies it as a foreign invader. So antibodies are then produced to attack those tissues. So examples can include arthritis, MS, and lupus. So that's everything I'm covering for chapter two. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, if you refer to my office hours on the syllabus, you'll know when I'll be definitely at my computer. And um, otherwise, just remember to go through the chapters because I don't cover absolutely everything in the lectures. And um, like I said, you can check out those YouTube videos if you just want another perspective or another way to go over um, these systems. I believe there were videos for every system. It's just, I figured I'd throw it in for the more complex ones. Our next chapter will be chapter three, which talks about health behaviors in general. And we'll be touching, next week we'll be touching on part of chapter four, which is health promoting behaviors. 
So what I'll do for those is probably just do one video containing chapter three and that portion of chapter four. Uh, that said, if you want to read ahead, go for it. That was just me trying to break things into a bit more manageable chunks, um, considering that there's 15 chapters. But otherwise, um, take care. Your assignment instructions should now be up on Blackboard along with the submission portal and everything. So if you have any questions, reach out to myself or you can reach out to the four GAs whose emails are listed on the syllabus. Um, concerning those assignments, because the GAs are marking them, um, we're not going to be doing any like quote unquote pre-marking, look it over, all that stuff. Just to try and keep it fair for everyone, if I can't offer it to everyone, um, I'm going to try and contain it and not offer it to anyone. So if you have specific questions about formatting or about how to do this certain part of the assignment, go for it. Um, but we just can't do any like look overs, right? But otherwise, um, it's really nice here and it's usually colder here than it is in other parts of Ontario or wherever you are. So I hope you can get out and enjoy some sunshine and stay safe. And I will be back next week for chapter three and part of four. And Vegas says goodbye as well. <laughs>